But it's 10 p.m. now, the time in those other channels tend to tell you what you should be thinking. But this is where you have your chance to speak to the rest of the United Kingdom through GB Views. And last week, the polls closed in the Batley and Spen by-election, with Labour's Kim Ledbetter beat her, winning her late sister Joe Cox's former seat by a tiny margin of 323 votes. It wasn't just the photo finish that made this vote like no other. Before a single ballot had been cast, the by-election had been making headlines after being described as one of the most toxic in British political history, with many commentators placing the blame on my guest for tonight's big question. Forty years after beginning his political career as the youngest ever chair of the Scottish Labour Party, George Galloway finished third behind Labour and the Conservatives at Batley and Spen with a sizeable 21.9% of the vote, despite only launching his economically radical and socially conservative Workers' Party of Britain 18 months earlier. Though effective, his anti-woke campaign appealing to the area's Muslim population, which took a tough stance on cancel culture and LGBT sex education in schools, had been branded negative, angry and aggressive by MPs and anti-discrimination groups. George, who was ejected from Labour in 2003 for his vocal opposition to the Iraq war, was accused of using shameful tactics in an open letter from local Muslim women by exploiting anger over Labour's silence on Palestine. Attacks on Labour campaigners, condemned by Boris Johnson as utterly sickening and appalling, as well as on Kim Leadbeater herself, have been attributed to his presence in the race. Now, after announcing he will contest the results of the by-election, which he says was dominated by lazy and fake tropes, George has even been dubbed Britain's answer to Donald Trump. But like with Trump, have the left been too quick to dismiss the former respect leader? While the usual woke publications and commentators have uphold helped the result as a rejection of the Workers' Party and its policies, after reducing Labour's lead by over 3,200 in the Northern Stronghold, is this a vote of confidence for George to continue waging war against his former party and Keir Starmer? George, thank you for being here tonight. Look, did you get what you wanted? I would presume not, because Keir Starmer still remains leader of the Labour Party and he didn't lose. Well, uh, in a party political sense, Keir Starmer being the leader of the Labour Party is the best thing that could happen to us. He's the reason why we have grown exponentially in the 19 months uh, since the party was launched. We have branches from Penzance to Peterhead. We have thousands of members, a thousand new members in the last two weeks alone. And Starmer and the direction he's taken Labour in and the ineffectual nature of the opposition that he has uh, offered is, has left a vacuum and we are trying to fill it. But if I may, Dan, uh, answer some of the lazy tropes that you repeated, uh, not blaming you for doing so, but they are lazy tropes. Uh, in the words of the famous harlot, Mandy Rice Davis, they would say that, wouldn't they? They are the people we were fighting against. There were no attacks on the Labour candidate. That's simply untrue. There was verbal harassment by someone completely unknown to me at the time, although I now realise he was thrown out of one of my public meetings in Dudley Town Hall okay, in 20. Just to be clear, just to be clear, um, are you denying that you had anything to do with the pamphlet that was distributed about the Labour candidate's sexuality that had nothing to do with you or your campaign? Uh, that would be a defamatory suggestion. No, I'm just asking uh, you know the question. Well, uh, you, you, know, you know very well uh, that I am not homophobic. And if you don't know it, you can consult my parliamentary record. My parliamentary record so exemplary that in the days when it was worth having, I was given a stonewall commendation. So it is flatly a defamatory lie to describe me as homophobic. So I don't know what pamphlet you're referring to. I've never heard that referred to before. 
let alone seen it. Uh, but if such a pamphlet exists, if it dealt with my opponent's sexuality, then I absolutely condemn it. This is the problem, you see, Dan. Uh, I can't be responsible for everything that other people do that are nothing to do with me or my campaign. I was in the process of explaining to you that the individual who verbally harangued the Labour candidate, mm -hmm. uh, which led to the very facts that will be dealt with by the court uh, in due course, uh, had not, not only nothing to do with me, but had had to be physically ejected from one of my public meetings in 2019 in the Dudley Town Hall. He is a campaigner against LGBT education. He's from Birmingham. He was completely unknown to me and said nothing about me in his angry tirade against the candidate. Now, that then became a lie that went round the world before the truth had got its trousers on. The Labour candidate said on television, and everyone, including your channel, repeated it, that I had been laughing on the other side of the road when this was all happening. In truth, I was on the same side of the road, a hundred yards away, and on camera, being filmed for <laughs> television, and therefore could not have possibly been laughing on the other side of the road. This will be a material issue uh, in the court case to overturn uh, the election. Yes, and I'm going to come to the court case in one know. moment, George. I'm going to come to the court case in one moment. But there were some words that were attributed to you in a leaflet and also that you spoke about in a speech uh, that have been described as homophobic. So I want you to clarify them. Uh, in your speech, you spoke about anal sex a lot and uh, this claim, no, I that, not, and this claim that anal sex was being taught in schools. Now, Done. anal well, sex is. has not been taught well, in well. schools, is it, George? And in your leaflet, Done. you said, I will demand parental involvement in the school curriculum. I don't want my children to be taught in a moral vacuum. What were you referring to there? I agree with that statement, Dan. Uh, a lot of people of all ethnicity and all backgrounds believe that parents should have a much greater say, particularly on this a uh, very sensitive field of what our children are taught and when they are taught it about sex. Now, I did not speak about anal sex a lot, as you have just said. I said this, I don't want my seven-year-old to be taught about masturbation. Nothing homophobic about that. Secondly, you said, I said, or anal I don't sex. want my children to be taught that parents chest feet rather than women breastfeed. Nothing homophobic about that. And I said once, not a lot, that I don't want my children to be taught about anal sex. And I don't, nor vaginal sex. But they're not, though, are they, George? They're not being taught, be taught, taught about, about that. Sex by a teacher that I don't know and don't know the moral standing of. Mm -hmm. So I think George, a lot of are people they being taught that about way. that? Sorry? Are they being taught about that? Uh, yes, there are teaching materials uh, that are in circulation that have been widely reported in newspapers that you formerly worked for, uh, which say exactly that. And if they are merely on the drawing board and not yet in the classroom, it's still time to stop them. It, it's really quite basic. I don't think primary school children should be being taught about sex. And if they are going to be so, I want a say on what they're going to be taught. And a lot of parents watching this on GB News agree with me. What about the teacher, George? What should happen to him, the teacher that showed the cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad uh, in class, he has been driven from the area. He is too scared to return to his job. You described it as him showing a hate poster in an interview with The Guardian. But what do you think should happen to the teacher now? 
Trust me, Dan, I've never given an interview to The Guardian. I have not spoken to The Guardian for very many years and shall never give them an interview or speak to them again. Uh, I'm surprised you're praying these liberal rags in aid uh, of this uh, interview. Uh, but let me tell you, if I had been the member of parliament at the time, this would never have happened. If it had happened, I would have led the response to it and avoided the ugliness that we saw outside the school. And if I had been elected last Thursday, I personally would have walked the teacher back to school. I would have resolved this matter very quickly. Labour, on the other hand, ran away from it and are still running away from it. They left the teacher out to dry, and I'll tell you why. The teacher did nothing wrong. He taught a lesson that had been handed to him from the head teacher, who had handed it to him after the clearance of the local education authority. So this goes up the tree, not down the tree. The teacher himself did nothing wrong. And according to Paul Halloran, uh, the uh, quite well-known independent political campaign around here, uh, actually there wasn't even an image of the Prophet Muhammad ever shown in the classroom, which as I said in my speech in Batley Center, makes you wonder what this was all about. Okay, we've got lots of questions coming in from our viewers, George, so I want to get to them. And John, uh, on the GB News Twitter account, has asked a very relevant one. Are you going to challenge the result in court? I'm actually in my lawyer's office right now uh, working on the case. On what Works, grounds? Um, on what Bill grounds? Willis. Sorry? On what grounds are you going to challenge it? Uh, multiple grounds. I'm not sure you've got enough time to hear them all, but the headlines would be the making of a false statement about an opponent in an election. And I gave you uh, the most salient of those, the false statement made by the Labour candidate on television that I had been on the other side of the road laughing when she was being harangued by an Islamist extremist on Kashmir and LGBT matters when I was on the same side of the road, a hundred yards away, and being into... OK. On any other grounds, is... George? You've already explained that, but on any other grounds, are you going to challenge yes, the result? Yes, uh, lots uh, of them. Uh, the unlawful taking down of thousands of our election posters uh, three days before the poll on absolutely unlawful, bogus grounds. Uh, the, uh, the Labour Party's vast overspend there was a ceiling on spending in this by-election of £100,000. My reckoning is that Labour bust that at least twice and maybe... What times. proof do you have for that, George? That what proof do you have for that? Uh, this is another material aspect, but perhaps... But what uh, proof the, do you have uh, for that, George? Sorry? What proof do you have for that? Uh, well, we don't have proof until Labour produces their election expenses, but the court will require them to do so. Uh, but the uh, most disturbing for most people was the failure of the returning officer to recount the votes when the majority was less than 1%. The law is very clear uh, that if the margin of victory is less than 1%, there should be a recount of the votes, and there was not. The Conservatives demanded it. It was refused. I demanded it. It was refused. We believe the returning officer behaved unreasonably there. And breaking news, we have video of postal votes. Some of your viewers will remember those from Peterborough and elsewhere. Postal votes, large, large numbers of postal votes arriving in the dead of night in unsealed black plastic bin bags and being thrown onto the counting table in the early hours of the morning. We have video of that. So there are many other reasons. You don't honestly have time to hear them all, but I promise you our case is much stronger than the Phil Woolis case, which led to the disqualification of the Labour MP 
Phil okay. Lewis. OK, yeah, well, we'll keep yeah. across this. Lots of other questions coming in. Tony on GB Views asks, did Labour seek to capitalise on Joe Cox's death by petitioning her sister to stand? Well, I think it was a cynical move, uh, but I refrained always from uh, criticising or attacking my opponent uh, for that obvious reason, and I don't want to start now. Okay. Uh, but there were several local, active, elected Labour people who thought they should have been the candidate and were passed over, and that was one of Labour's problems. Okay. See, all of this chaff, Dan, is to hide the fact that I took 22% of Labour's votes. So if it's really being said that I am all these awful ists and obias, uh, then this is really aimed at the 22% who used to vote Labour, by the way, and were never insulted then, but who came to me in this election. Got lots more questions coming in. Adrian uh, asks, are you going to tuck in and eat your hat as promised, given Labour didn't finish third? Well, after the court case, uh, if the election result is upheld, then I guess I'll have to, Dan, if you could provide some, I don't know, Tabasco to make it more palatable, I will. <laughs> it's a deal. It's a deal. Uh, Pacey. I'll do it on your show. Pacey on uh, GB Views asks, did it upset you under Corbyn that Labour became a hotbed for anti-Semitism? And was Labour right to kick out Chris Williamson and Ken Livingstone? I, I don't accept the premise of the question at all. Uh, there are undoubtedly anti-Semites on the left. Uh, if I didn't know that before the Corbyn era, uh, I did discover it, but not many and not nearly as many as are in the Conservative Party or in uh, golf clubs up and down the country or in other parts of the society. Anti-Semitism is a real thing. But the idea that Jeremy Corbyn was an anti-Semite or Chris Williamson was an anti-Semite is completely false, completely untrue. And Adrian asks, are you still friends with Jeremy Corbyn? No, I haven't spoken to Jeremy Corbyn for many years. OK. Uh, from Josie on GB Views, has intersectionality destroyed politics and left behind the vast majority of the working class? Uh, I don't know about intersectionality. I'm not sure I know what that means, Dan. I'm just a working man in my prime. Uh, but uh, I think identity politics has destroyed the Labour Party. Uh, the fetishization of race, of sexual orientation of gender questions, uh, of, uh, of ethnicity and so on, the endless banging on about these things, to the exclusion, virtually, of class politics has destroyed the Labour Party and has left a lot of territory for the Workers' Party to cover. Uh, Jed asks, but I have to admit there have been very many questions along a similar theme, but Jed asks, what was the purpose of your meeting with uh, Uday Hussein in 2006? My goodness, that's an old one. Whiskers on that one. I was in Iraq trying to stop the war, uh, Dan. I don't normally get asked these questions now because I've been proved so uh, comprehensively right about Iraq and those that made the war have, uh, have been proved so comprehensively wrong. Uh, so Jed, uh, full marks to Jed, he's the last man standing uh, defending uh, the war. OK, but you're not going to address that meeting? Well, I had lots of meetings uh, in Iraq. Uh, Uday Hussein was the uh, son of the president. I was trying to persuade the president, more fool me, uh, to allow the arms inspectors back in. Uh, to continue their inspections, uh, to avoid the war. Uh, the president did allow the arms inspectors back in, only to see the country destroyed. They were bent on the war, so all of my efforts were wasted. Uh, John on GB, New, GB Views asks, what constituency are you planning on losing in next? Maybe not a nice way of putting it, but there are lots of rumours, George, that you've got your eyes on another seat. No, no, I, I intend to uh, fight this uh, election again when the court finds in our favour. OK. 
And just finally, in this block, uh, a question from Johnny on Instagram, and maybe not a surprise, we've got this one from Instagram. Do you regret licking milk out of the bowl on Celebrity Big Brother? I regret doing it so well, Dan. Uh, if I had just gone through the motions, nobody would still be talking about it on Instagram or anywhere else. But because it was a task for food for uh, the housemates, and because I was in the house, to raise a very substantial amount of money for charity, I kind of felt that I should do it well. I'm one of these people who believes if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing well. And lots of people do daft things for charity. George Galloway here with me for tonight's big question. Let me bring my panel now to senior reporter for the I newspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, the Daily Express columnist and commentator, Carol Malone, and GB News presenter, Neil Oliver. Carol, do you have a question for George? George, I've got a couple. First one, you said you were going to eat your hat if Labour won. You haven't done that yet, have you? No, because the election isn't over yet, Carol. I'm taking it to court. And uh, when the court finds in our favour, there'll be no need for me to eat my hat. But if it finds against us, in the unlikely event, I promised uh, Dan that I'd eat it live on his show. Good, that's good to... On the record. <laughs> <laughs> We've listen, got that now. The, the by-election was mired in accusations of aggression, intimidatory, beha intimidatory behaviour, um, all this going on with your campaigns. And I heard you say before that, you know, it's not your responsibility what other people do. But it kind of is, George. They're members of your party, or if they're not members, they support your party. And what they're doing, they're doing in your name. You do have a responsibility. Can you give me an example of what anybody did in the campaign to which you're... Well, we are talking about... The, about about LG, LGBT campaigners being upset. I, I, I already explained to Dan, this man is not only not a supporter of my campaign, he was thrown out of one of my public meetings in 2019. He goes but, around the country monstering people yeah. on the LGBT issue. He's, he's literally nothing to do with my campaign. But George, Kim Ledbetter was actually had to have police protection uh, in, in during so the campaign. I. Many are saying so because of your campaigners. So did I have to have police protection. I'm not blaming that on any of the other candidates. Were there that threats is, against you, George? Not credibly be blamed on me. George, were there threats against you? Not only threats against me, Dan, it managed to evade the entire British press that people were photoshopping pictures of me with my children holding automatic weapons and circulating them all over social media. Everybody in Batley and Spen has seen a picture of me holding a weapon, except I've never held a weapon. I was myself the victim of dirty tricks, not the perpetrator of them. I had police protection. Why do you think I'm wearing a hat, Dan? I was a victim of political violence. I could show you my scars, but it would put you off your tee. So I'm the last person to be in any way sanguine about anyone being subjected, even to haranguing, which is what happened on that occasion. This well, can, can I ask you one last thing, George? Nothing whatsoever to do with me, and I certainly wasn't laughing on the other side of the road while he was doing it. Yep, no, you've made that point. Carol, you come back. Can I, can I ask you one last thing, George? You were never going to win in Batley and Spen. Yes, you took 21, 22% of the votes, but you were never going to win. Why did you stand there knowing that? You're, you've tried, you tried to get into the Scottish Parliament. Your big political days are over, surely. Are you not just agitating now? Well, uh, nothing wrong with agitating, Carol. You've made a great living out of it. <laughs> Uh, the purpose of standing in elections is to grow your party and attract support uh, for what you believe in. Uh, everyone has the right to stand in elections. And I did rather well from a standing start. Everyone was saying I wouldn't even know the names of the streets. I was a foreigner, I was an alien, uh, and so on. The polls, you'll recall, predicted I'd get 6% of the mm. vote. I got 22% of the vote. Most people would think that was quite a good vote, Carl. You were never going to win, though. Well, I don't accept that. I mean, 
Every candidate goes into an election believing that they can win. If I'd got 2,500 more votes than I got off Labour, uh, me and Labour would have had the same vote. Do the maths. OK. Look, Benjamin Butterworth, do you want to come in? George, you've claimed uh, rather unbelievably that you had nothing to do with the anti-LGBT rhetoric and activists. But there's no doubt that among the Muslim support that you had, you benefited from that stirring up of homophobia. So tell me, are those Muslims and anybody else who have anti-gay views and who voted for you, do you reject their votes because they're homophobic? Uh, no more than Labour rejected them when they voted for Labour. Uh, our uh, leading campaigner, uh, leading woman campaigner, by the way, in our campaign, was herself gay. I am, as is quite well known, because I quite often have to say it, uh, I'm the holder of a Stonewall Award. But when you were in Parliament for Bethnal Green and Bow, you abstained on some of the votes about LGBT issues. That's so I think you slightly exaggerate. But tell me... not true. It's, it, it is true and people can check. But, George, let me ask you, are those Muslims wrong to have anti-gay views? Let me answer. I was a campaigner for gay rights before you were born. I was given a commendation from Stonewall when you were in short trousers. I have an impeccable vote. Are you going to answer my question, as, George? As can be inspected in the House of Commons on gay rights. Mm, and I have inspected it. George, answer my question. Are those Muslim voters wrong to have anti-gay views? Yes, anyone okay. has. Any and now my next question, because you're always the victim in these, is about Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who's been locked up in Iran. Judge, neither are you my interrogator. I wasn't finished answering your last question. So let me do so. I am a campaigner for gay rights long before you were born. That's the answer to your question. Uh, I but don't hang on. If the people who I don't know and you don't know what the views about gay rights are of the thousands of people that voted. Well, we do know because we saw the evidence on the streets and we've seen the polling. Okay, Benjamin, what's your final question for George? assumption, because equality covers many fields, of course. Not just gays are entitled to equality. Nazanin's a... equality. And they're entitled George, can I, can I ask my question? I think we've got the gist of your answer by now, haven't we? Entirely baseless. We've got the gist of your answer, which is that you're always the victim, and it's just a coincidence that for 20 years of your political career, you have been surrounded by stirring up hatred against minorities and other people, and that is pure coincidence as far as you're concerned. Now, one victim that's real is Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who's been locked up in Iran. Am I going to get the question? I think we've heard your answer. What it is is pure libel. Well, you, you say that a lot. No way of knowing who uh, voted for me, what their religion is, what their ethnicity is. We know what you do. Or what their attitude to homosexuality is. OK, you, you okay. can I get my question in? George, Your Benjamin has one slander. final question. That's all that you are. My question is, a real victim is Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who's been locked up in Iran for five years and just got locked up again on the nonsense claims of propaganda activities. Do you condemn Iran? Is that my fault? Why are you throwing that at me? Because you defend so many of the people in that parts of the world and it's a question that you can ask any politician. It's a relevant political question. So do you, do you condemn Iran? You're some racist. What, they all look alike, do they? No, George, you're a politician, and that's a relevant question about a British... Okay, Benjamin, let George answer. Let George answer the question. This lady. What are you talking about, man? Dan, I appeal to you. Get this man under control. Why don't you answer the question? Well, Benjamin's what asked the, the question now. We're a broad church here, George. What do I have to do... Do you condemn Iran? ...of Nazanin? I've been trying to get her out, you half-wit. In what way? In ways that are none of your business. Oh, so you can't tell us only and are the business only of her family. I met her family on television and I've been trying to get her out ever since. Pipe down. I've had enough of you. Okay. And do you still support no, Assad? That was, that was your last question because we've got to get Neil Oliver in. Neil, your question for George Galloway. 
Hello, George. Good to see you. Uh, I, just to change the tack a little bit, you, you obviously you were uh, a, a strong voice in Scotland uh, recently before uh, Batley in Spain. Uh, I wonder, you know, the, the result notwithstanding in, in Scotland of the election, whether you thought the tide was was turning against the SNP and against the breakup of the union, or, or otherwise. I, I wondered, I, I, given your, your recent experience, I, I, I really how you read the situation. Uh, I, I know that I know that Ian Blackford will be glad that he doesn't have to face me in the House of Commons. I would have uh, punctured some of his uh, overblown rhetoric in a way that isn't really being done uh, by either of the front benches. Uh, but I do think it has. I think the SNP are in deep trouble. I think the separatist project is in deep trouble. Uh, like Labour, uh, they have uh, gone off on a, a, a high-flying uh, identity politics a series of fantasies, and it has led them into difficulty. I think the uh, issue of the party's money uh, going missing, the issue of the shipyard uh, that they nationalised and have lost millions of taxpayers pounds on the issue of the smelter in the Highlands, all these things. It's, as Mr. Macmillan once said, it's never one damn thing. It's one damn thing after another. I think the, the danger uh, of the country breaking up, while still real, uh, is no longer as acute as it was, say, even six months ago.